Equality, equity. What's the difference? It's been said that equality is making sure that everyone has a pair of shoes, but that equity is ensuring that people have a pair of shoes that fit them. As we talk about the difference in the commonalities between these two concepts, we'll talk with K-12 educators, university professors, and we'll also talk with community activists around how they help to build equity in our educational systems. This particular segment, we're going to talk with uh, professionals who are working in uh, K-12 education about this idea of equity and how does that equity get actionable in in their K-12 settings. And so, uh, to begin or start this conversation, um, Carol, can you uh, just kind of introduce yourself and, and, and tell us a little bit about yourself? And we'll continue around the the, the circle in that that same manner. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Carol Markham Cousins, and I'm currently the executive director at an organization called Mediation Services for Anoka County. But for over 30 years, I've been uh, a public school educator and principal in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and a few other places. Um, I consider myself um, a teacher. That's really what I've been. It's my students that have taught me most things. And so currently, the work that I'm doing is all around mediation it's about uh, helping communities and individuals repair harm to create peaceful communities. And it's um, the, the place it's in Coon Rapids, Mediation Services for Anoka County. All right, great, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tyrone Brookins, uh, currently serve as principal of Roseville Area Middle School. Um, Prior to that, I was a principal in St. Paul. Uh, did that for 15 years, and uh, this is my 21st year in education. Um, I am a big supporter of education, and truly believe that education um, emancipates change in the lives of individuals. And so, for that to happen, uh, we got to have the right people in front of our students, so that their possibilities do become endless and they can see a future for themselves. So I'm very passionate about education and I'm glad to be here. Great, great. Thank, you. thank you. My name is Comanche Fairbanks. I am a media community specialist for uh, Minnesota Indian Women and Sexual Assault Coalition and also a youth educator. I've been a youth educator for a little over seven years. Um, but if you really want to break down into it, I've been a youth educator for 17 years. That's uh, my oldest child. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, just uh, wh what I try to do is more preventative side of the work uh, regarding violence against women and children and in indigenous communities. So being a man, since we predominantly uh, commit violence as a man and men around, uh, we, we, we we're obligated and we are the ones who can prevent the violence. Yeah, so, so that's my focus, being in an Indian Social Assault Coalition. Yeah. My name is Ryan Vernash. I am a first year principal at Maxfield Elementary School in St. Paul, right in the, the heart of the historic Rondo community. Uh, prior to that, I served on our superintendent's cabinet as a policy and strategic planning administrator. Uh, and then prior to that, I was able to teach at Maxfield, where I'm principal at now, uh, where in 2010 I was named Minnesota Teacher of the Year and was uh, incredibly humbled to be able to share the stories of our scholars across the state and country. Um, I have, I've taught multiple different levels from preschool uh, all the way through middle school. Uh, and to me, uh, education is the ultimate gatekeeper to life's opportunities. Uh, and the work that we're doing at Maxfield as a principal and what I did as a, an instructor is to really focus on being actively anti-racist. Culturally responsive teaching is, is critical, but we have to go deeper and be actively anti-racist. We can't be passive about this work. 
Okay. And uh, my name is Kate Toll, and I um, am an independent professional. Uh, my business is named Project Start Leadership, and I center youth voice in teacher and community development. And so um, the way that I came at this, ironically, was as a parent. I was in a whole other line of work, and I am a writer. Um, but as I watched my children in school and watched the, the challenges they were facing and that their peers were facing, I decided to do something about it. So I became a very, very involved, engaged parent, working with other parents because I could see that parents weren't having access to the system and that their voices were marginalized. As I went even further, I learned that student voice, students were uh, very, very marginalized and, and um, unable to really talk about what, what was impacting them in their school settings. And so in 2011, um, I actually worked with youth to submit an idea to St. Paul Foundation's Facing Race Idea Challenge, and that was the birth of my, of my work. So, okay, so I'm, I'm listening to all of your introductions, and there, there's some things that I, uh, I, I wrote down that I thought were very interesting, but, um, that hopefully you will help me remember to, to address, right? So I have my notes here. But I thought it was interesting that there, uh, there was a comment about education emancipating, emancipating people. So uh, I thought that was an interesting point. Um, and then there was this idea that there has to be the right people um, in, in, in front of our students. And then lastly, this idea that um, education uh, needs to be anti-racist. Right, so I'm, I'm going to come back to those three, three, those three points in our conversation. And if you, in our conversation, see a place where those things can jump in or or whatnot, please please do so. So I want to start off with this essential question: being, what is equity, particularly in a in a K-12 situation? So so how do you talk about equity? What is equity, um, particularly in a, in a K-12 institution? What is equity? Well, it starts off with uh, moving from being a word to a phrase to part of board policy. And then from board policy, it goes into, it, sh it should go into practice. So I'm being facetious, <laughs> if, you, if you haven't figured it out, right. that we often talk about equity in education, but when we think about what equity in education really means, I would say it has different meaning for different people. Uh, when, uh, if you were to ask me that question, I would say four or five years ago, I immediately went to uh, the uh, uh, focus on black boys. Uh, now, my perspective on equity, I would say it has broad and it has become more inclusive of other um, uh, student groups, uh, uh, other students, uh, uh, disabilities, and you know uh, other situations that are prevalent in education now. Uh, the most recent thing is the uh, uh, transgender uh, 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 training and development that my particular district is going through. So when you talk about equity in education, it has multiple meanings to multiple individuals. And we always come back to the uh, experiences that uh, we have as, as people first and foremost. And so we take a term and then we apply that term to our lived experiences and where we are you know, with our journey. Um, from there, we get behind a cause. And so you're gonna have some educators, they're gonna get behind the achievement gap. You're gonna have some educators that get behind uh, gender equity. You're gonna have some educators who get behind uh, students with disabilities, students uh, from uh, 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 immigrant students. And so, but it's all under the auspices of, of equity. Okay. Now, for me personally, you know, equity is about meeting the needs of all students. And so, when you say all, Brookings, what do you mean? Well, I'm saying everyone who's at the table. And that requires a lot of differentiation, but it also requires a lot of time and patience understanding from, my, from uh, where I am. Uh, I, I view my role as principal as probably the most important role um, in the profession. Not to you know, uh, be boastful, but I have a say into the curriculum. 
I have a say into who's enacting that curriculum, and I have a uh, responsibility to meet the needs of all students. And so if I'm going to do my job, I need to do it very well in an equitable sense. And so, yes, I have to learn about my immigrant students and where they're coming from, what their needs are. I have to learn about my transgender students uh, or uh, my students with disabilities. I have to you know, meet the needs of my black and brown students. And so wherever I am in that equity, I don't know what word to use, but <laughs> that equity definition, you know, it's my responsibility as the principal of that building to make sure that all my students are uh, having their needs met. Okay, and so, you're talking about so, equity intersectionality, too, mm -hmm. because you're not saying, uh, be, because a student who is African-American may also uh, identify as queer. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that that student has uh, their needs met according to their needs. So, so, so you, you just dropped the, the uh, again, they did this in the last segment. Mm -hmm. They started dropping all these bombs, and I, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, we can't address. So you talk about this idea of uh, intersectionality. So can you just give a, a quick definition? But I want to go back to to what is equity. But when you say intersectionality, what are you talking, what is that? I don't, what are you talking well, about? Well, because there's all these, there, there are different um, identities that each one of us has. Um, you know, when I first introduced myself, I was talking about being a mother uh, and a parent. Um, and, and when you're talking about equity, you're talking about different ways throughout history where um, a certain part of our identity was experienced oppression or, or um, did not have access to resources in the way that would be ideal and optimal for a healthy education. And so intersectionality means we look at all those pieces. Um, if a student, we, we look at gender, we look at, we look at level of ability, we look at, um, because not only are students who are disabled often marginalized, but students who have a high amount of intelligence and capability often don't get their needs met either. And I don't think, we use the term gifted, but I don't think that captures what those students' real challenges are. You know, so, so, so we have saying, to... So and, you're su suggesting that intersectionality is this place where all of those different aspects of myself kind of come together and are... Respect those differences and, and bring them together. Okay. And, and honor them um, and their needs according to their needs. Um, so we take, we take those pieces into account um, rather than, you know, so much of our issues stem from stereotyping and taking one person in one group and then identifying all these characteristics with that group. Um, so we have to look at patterns that are experienced by different groups, such as um, folks who, um, who uh, self-identify on the gender equity spectrum, right? Which we all do, right? essentially. But we have to look at um, uh, those patterns within a broader social historical context. It's very, it, it's complex, but it's the only way to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to throw out another term that we all know, oppression Olympics. You know, otherwise students start to compete with each other. So we want to create containers and systems uh, of, uh, I don't even like the word system, but cultures of respect where we can um, build respect for all those different identities that students have and, right. and that so, we have. So, so we just talked about this idea of intersectionality. I want to go back to the original question, which was, what is equity? So, so we, we just talked about this intersectionality where we have all these different parts of ourselves and they need to be so-called respected, right? Um, but why? Go ahead. To me, in my role as a principal, I view equity as wanting to eliminate the predictability of school achievement based on numerous different levels or uh, indicators. That could be standardized tests, could be our formative assessments, it could be behavior data. Uh, because right now, we can make uh, reasonable predictions about what student groups are going to be successful in school based on historical marginalization, based on contemporary marginalization. Uh, and so what 
our vision is for our school is to remove those predictability patterns, uh, to make sure, and part of that is taking into account the intersectionality, but we wanna make sure that no matter what a person comes into our school, that they're gonna be leaving our programming with the skills necessary, the mindset necessary, uh, to have as many opportunities that, uh, as possible when they move into middle school and ultimately high school and then post-secondary education. So to me, it, it's really just, it gets down to removing that predictability because if we can uh, eliminate that piece, then I feel that we're actually moving in the direction of all of our students having the opportunities they have a God-given right to. Do I want to just add to that or challenge that? Um, and I'm not challenging you. Um, equity in a system, equity in our K-12 public system. Is it possible? So how, how do you do that? How do you actually say that we're going to know every kid that comes in and we're going to remove those barriers so that every student, whether they walk in the door on time or not, on time ready to learn or not, are gonna have this opportunity. And I would challenge us to say that we're trying to retrofit into a system, I'm just gonna say it here, built on white supremacy. And, and the reason why I say that is, um, I love being a principal, it's, I am so proud of that. I walk in that. Um, but for years, I think that I was a part of that fabric. When I wasn't challenging the schedule, the curriculum, the demands, they are continual. I was there from the 1970s when we had none of that to the 1990s where no child left behind became law and order and we criminalized student behavior, and then we blamed it on what, right? And then we said, well, we gotta bring all the black boys back in, but what have we been doing for how many decades to actually just criminalize them? So what is equity? And so, 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 so again, you, you dropped a term that I'd like to kind of talk about. You said that you felt like you were retrofitting that, or yeah. that we're currently retrofitting. What, so, is that, what does that mean well, to retrofit? So just take two houses, right? Uh -huh. um, so you have one that you build from new, yep. right? And you get to do that yourself. Or you take one that you've got that's been there a while. My husband's a cement mason, so I get this. And then you just kind of work it, right? Things change and you got to retrofit. You got to, oh, we're going to put new plumbing in. Maybe put a new roof on. So, okay, so maybe we'll, we'll do differentiation. Maybe we won't do standardized tests anymore. We're going to do formative assessments. We're retrofitting. And, and in some cases, that works some. Uh, but we are still struggling with our system meeting the needs of every kid. When are we going to build new? When are we not going to have a system that looks like a factory that's based on time and not learning? So, 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 so you're saying, so uh, essentially you're saying the fact that there is a teacher in the front of the room and that there are rows of students in, uh, in the classroom being asked to, to sit in a particular way, uh, that configuration of our, of our classroom has been going on for at least 150 years? And you're saying that we need to change that or that... I am yeah, actually one thing that Carol was talking about earlier. Um, you know, when, when we talk about that system of white supremacy, we're talking about power and prejudice, right? And if you add the authority piece <coughs> of adults in education, like us, right, then that becomes what a student experiences as adultism in the classroom. And so, um, when, when you have those structures where there's road seating and um, awards in a cupboard and, um, you know, where, where the, the teacher's in authority, um, yes, those are all systems that are really hurting our youth 
because we all know when we get in classrooms where, you know, you've got the Ryan Vernashes of the world, the kids are engaged, they're all important, they're doing group shared responsibility and power, and they're probably at tables doing group projects or in circles. So that, that's where I feel the, the role of the principal comes into play, um, it, to, to help classroom teachers develop that kind of environment. Uh, and I agree that I think the system needs to be turned up, uh, up on it, its head. And I think in that time when we're still fighting that, it's not an either or. I believe that we have to advocate for that and still be able to set our students up for success in the system that we're confined in for right now. But as a principal, I want my teachers to be incubators of innovativeness in the classroom. And that means that if a teacher has a brilliant idea, or even a just real out there idea on getting our kids hooked and engaged a project, I need to create a safe spot in the school to be able to make that happen. Maybe it's throwing out part of the district curriculum that is being required right now, uh, as long as it's meeting the expected standards, but giving that space for our teachers to really work their magic. Well, Carol's talking about, you know, uh, I remember this science project that I did when I was in school um, called hydroponics, and we had to, I, I grew. Um, no one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Way to put that. <laughs> I taught school, too, so anytime you say yeah. hydro, keep it. <laughs> well, it's all about the growth mindset, right? Um, so so I, I had um, plants that I grew in, in rocks out of rocks instead of soil. And we all know that, that soil works better. But you can still grow things in rocks with, with nutrients. And um, I always say in this work, it's about finding where the soil's fertile, but sometimes you gotta grow with rocks. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what you're talking about is, so you got the rocks, and, and it's, really, it's really by all mean, means necessary. It's whatever it takes, right? So, uh, 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 can I want to pull Comanche in a break? Because yeah. we had a, a previous discussion, and, and this has to do with equity. So uh, one of the things that's inequitable in, in schools is how we oftentimes um, create layers and boxes and places for kids to be, especially high school. I'm a high school person, right? You come into high school and you're, you're an honors kid, you're a regular kid, or you're a dumb kid, right? We all know it. And so when we look at the curriculum that we've established, especially when you get into high school, um, you, get in a, you get in a box, right? And so can you talk a little bit about the whole math thing? Because when we talk about equity, we could use the system right now and change it up a little bit. Yeah. Just, I know, just... Like, so, so my story was about... Once I got to Algebra 2, I started doing bad. I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend what was going on. Um, and, and I used to go to one of my friends' house where she, we would help each other. And she was an advanced student, so she was in accounting. And, and we were sitting there, and I was just struggling. I was like, man, I, I can't even do this. And she's like, well, well, let me check it out, and here's, here's my accounting book. Why don't you try it? Why don't you give that a try? I was like, all right. So I looked at it, and it was just like, well, this is simple. It's like all to do is place these numbers here and categorize them. It, it, it stemmed from me watching basketball and and taking down all the stats and categorizing everything. It's like so, once I got that accounting book right there, it's like tru -tru -tru, took me less than twenty minutes. I was done. And she's like, "What are you done already?" I was like, "Yeah." It's like it's so simple. And she looked at it and it was all correct. She's like, "Oh my god!" It's like I know it's just it's just crazy because because we we. We have this linear type of learning where everybody has to go through these steps to say that you can be here. When, when I've always believed and known that every student is important have, or at different levels and can comprehend different things at different times. Like we look at kids, they're, they're, they're so smart, they know things that us as adults have yet to learn or have forgotten or have been, what do you call, um, it has just been, we have unlearned it, right? So, so, so all of these kids at different levels have different experiences, so they all understand and have knowledge of things that each of us don't even 
realize that they know. So, so like when when I think of equity, it's it's about it's about having a safe space. When I think about gender, it's about having a safe space where everyone is valued, mm -hmm. right? And they all have a time to to receive these aha moments, and that it's equally right, the, where everyone understands and can relate to whatever you're teaching them, and there there's no boundaries in how you, how you teach these people. Right? It's interesting uh, when you share that story with me and with the group. It makes me think about. Uh, a, a philosophy that everybody needs to feel accepted, everybody needs to uh, feel a sense of belonging, and uh, and then they have something to contribute or a feeling of, of significance. You know, when you took that accounting book, you know, it made sense to you because you connected it to, you said, sports, and you know how you uh, created stats. We come back and we look at, you know, education, and I, I go back to Carol's question, are we fighting a losing battle? Can we really, you know, educate all children? Because, you know, we got the Comanchos of the world who are going to, you know, gravitate to accounting, but mm, our curriculum says that, no, you have to take Algebra 1, then Algebra 2. We're not going to even think about accounting because we're not sure how you're going to do an Algebra 2. And then I hear Ryan saying, like, you know what? I can, like, push that to the side because I know this student was just engaged with accounting. So how can I create this, an individualized learning plan for mm -hmm. that particular student? Now, we know we have IEPs in education, but we also need some ILPs mm -hmm. in education. Mm -hmm. And it takes a courageous leader, as I hear Ryan mm -hmm. saying, you know, I, I know the district requires me to do a set curriculum, but we're going to take this opportunity and do something different. And un until, unless we have leaders like Ryan just described, the system won't ever change. Yeah, and mm. even when you try to push against it, mm -hmm. the system will rebel. Because when you take away it's the... It's system. I mean, yes. You, you take away the label and you mm -hmm. say, you know what? We're going to do honors for no one or honors for everyone. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, I've had experience with that. Where I just said, you know what? Honors is good for you. Well, it should be good for you. It should be good for you. And we're just going to do that. But that's what we're going to call that. But is it, but, but, I mean, is it, you know, aren't there winners and losers in this world? Aren't there? I mean, should everybody, you know, should everybody get a, a, a get a trophy or certificate? Or I mean, you know, I pay good money, so my kid should be a starter, right? It, 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 to, so, so how is this not like this? this uh, psychological um, maiming of, of kids, this idea of, of equity. Everybody needs to get the same thing, or everybody, we, sh we got to tailor everything to, 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 to every individual. How is that not, a, you know, are, are there IEPs in life? How, how, is this, how is this actually helpful in, in all this stuff? Because we're talking about all this individual, you know, the, the police don't give me an individualized, you know, ticket. They got a statute. They no, pay. But you get a pass. If you're white and wealthy in this culture, I will say that. So maybe not, but you get passes if you have privilege in this culture. And I and I, I believe that that's what we're talking about here, right? A little bit. Well, if, and one thing we never do talk about, we never get there, is how we educate, how we, um, how we build awareness within those students that have those passes to understand that, meaning the white students, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do we get them to understand that they're part of a greater opportunity to build shared humanity? And, and, and that's why, like, one of the practices that, that I do is um, work with youth to um, to find their unique capacities as educators and then have them come to schools or have them go into the community, such as um, at the um, Overcoming Racism Conference. They did a workshop called um, Youth Telling, How to Get It Right, Not White. And they talked about, they, they, they did a um, miraculous thing that I still use in my consulting. They took a cultural narrative, and they passed it around in story circle like the phone game to illustrate how when we take a historical narrative, 
we all play a role in distortion. And the story will morph and change and evolve depending on who's doing the telling and who's doing the receiving. So and so we use different sources. But my point in that is the youth were the teachers. That was their idea, and they were teaching adults in the community. And we just need to take those risks. We need to take those risks um, and have everybody look at their vulnerability together, right? But also understand that even at this table that we're sitting at right now, we're creating culture. And each one of us will leave this table and have a different story about what happened here. So, so, I, I, so uh, there's a lot of stuff, right? So, I, you know, I, I'm feeling a little pressure that we're talking about some anti-white stuff, like being white is not okay, and and, and that kind of thing. Well, I and, didn't say being white's not okay. Okay, but, but, but that, it's I mean, part I, of the I, story. We we're saying white supremacy. I heard white supremacy. I heard anti-racism. So, what is that? I mean, this conversation of anti-racism and this white supremacy stuff. What what place does that even have in education? Shouldn't we be teaching our kids to get along? With with everybody and that we, you know, why are we bringing up stuff like white race, uh, uh, anti-racism or, or, you know, white supremacy? What, what does that have well, the, to do with education? The kids are learning these things out in the community and on the street, whether we're teaching it in the classroom or not. So we have an opportunity to have them educate us about their experience out there, you know, in life, right? And, and say, all of us, I would yeah. like to add, you got to name it. Because mm -hmm. you're never going to be able to address it if you don't name it. That's right. And then when we name it, certain people get into their feelings. I get into my feelings, <laughs> you know, so I'm not excluding myself. But let's put the feelings aside. Not saying that feelings don't matter because they, they definitely do matter. But just because we feel a certain way about a certain term, let's not go away from the table or go away from the conversation. Let's learn from it. And let's see what you mean by when you say white supremacy, when you say anti-racist. Are you calling me a racist? Like, no, I'm not, I didn't call you a racist. I said we got to put some anti-racist practice in place. Now, before we can do that, we must agree that racism does exist. And it's not just Tyrone's problem, but it's everyone at the table's problem. And then once we can, you know, name it, address it, then we can, you know, get to the learning aspect of it. And it's like, no, yeah, let's call it out because it has to be called out, you know? Uh, when we don't call it out, what you do is you invalidate those people who have those experiences. You know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, you, you mentioned a couple times law and order. I'm like, okay, is she 5-0 or what? <laughs> but, uh, but you're right. When we leave here, and I'm reflecting on this experience, I pull out the parking lot. Mm. You pull out the parking lot. Beautiful. It's two different uh, per uh, uh, perceptions, experiences once that cop car drives by. I'm thinking I'm more likely to get pulled over. That's real for me. So you, you can't come like, oh, no, Tyrone, that's, you, they're not going to pull you over. No, I've been pulled over X number of times. So this is a, a visceral feeling I'm having. That's right. So when you tell me that that's not real, you invalidate me. And the only way I know that is by talking to you, Correct. is by having a relationship with you. And when I talk about white privilege. I, I'm talking about being on a, a moving sidewalk. This is my image. I, I, I was born, even though I'm a woman, and that's another piece of the intersectionality, but I was born on a moving sidewalk. I just stand there, and she goes forward. And, and my awareness, being on that moving sidewalk, is to actually turn around and I need to walk against it, and I have relationships with my students primarily. Well, it has, it yeah. has been with my students that have taught me that. So, my awareness. Right? So, so using the metaphor of the moving sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. So you don't get to be on that sidewalk that's moving, and to tell me, Tyrone, you're just not running fast that's enough. That's right. right. Increase right. your stride. Pump right. your arms a little harder. You know, take advantage of the opportunity. Get up here. Pull right. yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah, well, here's. here's <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> we really got to talk about this other stuff, though, right? So we only have, we have about 10 minutes left, but I, I really want to address this because when we look at 
when we look at all negative e e uh, indicators, it appears that my so-called minorities, uh, in, in terms of successful indicators, are at the bottom. And when we look at negative indicators, they're at the top. So is there something inherently wrong with so-called minorities that they keep finding themselves in the, in, 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 at the bottom rungs of all successful indicators? Minority to what? Are you talking about color? Language? When you say minority, I mean, I just think, what are you talking about there? Tell me what you're talking about, Andre. So, so I'm talking about uh, Native Americans and African Americans primarily, and then Hispanic Americans, immigrants. They all seem to be at the lower rungs of all of our great successes here in Minnesota. So, so is there something wrong with them? Why, why do they keep showing up at the bottom of all these successful indicators? Well, they've been consistently and insidiously denied the kind of privileges that Carol and I have. And, you know, when we talk about um, th their, their experience, one thing that's been flooring me lately, because I've been doing some, some writing about this and looking at um, friendships, and that's not just friendships in society, but obviously that affects what happens in relationships in the classroom, right? Because, uh, you know, our kids, they can have one, diff one relationship with us as an adult in authority, but then they're struggling mightily to understand each other and to be accepted by each other. If they're mixed, they're not black enough. They're also not white enough, right? So they're trying to find their place in all of that, and they're also... You know, if I don't get, if I don't make friends with Tyrone, I don't understand his experience when he leaves this building and has that experience with the cop. I just read an article that only 1% of white people have a black friend. What does that mean for our children in the classroom? I'm quite passionate about this because I, and, and Carol, I know Carol, we are very intentional about, about um, reaching out and being friends and, and talking with people who have a different background and, and have experienced historical trauma in our country. But, but you're still not answering my question. Mm -hmm. Why do those people seem to always be, you know, when we talk about, you know, the so-called welfare rates, we talk about MFIB, we talk about uh, health disparities, we talk about educational disparities or the opportunity gap. It, it, it seems that those, those folks keep falling through the cracks. They're not doing well. Why is it? Is, it, is, is there something innately wrong with them or not? Um. Go ahead. Just, just this one saying is like, if you can't change the people around you, change the people around you, and I and I, and I struggle with that. Like living in a in a in a inner city, having my kids going to inner city school, and then we're thinking back to when I when I grew up on a reservation, and that's how the people were. The the schools, the environment, uh, the way the teachers taught us was horrible. I grew up where we're getting whipped and beaten still. Um, in the school system, but then once I changed the people around me and I asked to go to a public school, a white public school, they accepted me in well, what, what the, was different about the environment. It was, um, it was open and their heart was, um, what do you call, there was, um, there was an opportunity where they, they're treating education as a privilege and an opportunity. And I noticed when I took my kids out of the inner city, the same school where they're at right now, they're treating it as a privilege and an opportunity to take part of this education system. And it, and it's, it creates a whole different environment for them and how they feel about themselves and being accepted. And, and, and they, they, they went from the inner city from being a year, by, year and a half behind in education and going over there struggling, but the students, the, the environment, the, the classes, the teachers and everything work to help them get at the level where they need to be. And, and, I, and that's what helped me too as well, going to these white schools where the, the environment and every, the outlook on education was a, as an opportunity. It's like, you gotta take advantage of this. So did you change or did the system change, Kamanti? The, the, system, the system was different out there. Like where, yeah. where we're forced to yeah. go to education and inner city, we're forced to go to school. We have to go to school. Then everyone around us 
feels that pressure of being forced into doing something, you're not gonna wanna be forced to do something where you have to do it, right? You gotta want it, you gotta feel privileged in taking part of something. Um, then that's where college comes in if you had the privilege to, to, to get to some educational background. Mm -hmm. so, so, what, so what I actually hear is that there is nothing innately wrong with folks who find themselves in these things, but it's actually the environments and the systems that they're engaging in that may not be taking advantage or, or including them in some, some real fundamental ways. Yeah, so, yeah. so there is, when I look at the, the students that I'm privileged to serve at our school and our families, uh, we do not score well on standardized tests, but our kids have just innate brilliance inside them. Mm. Now, um, when I'm talking with a fifth grade young boy who uh, hasn't been doing well, and he comes out and shares to me, and this happened just a few weeks ago, he said, it doesn't matter, Mr. Vernash, it doesn't make one bit of difference what I'm doing in here, because I'm gonna end up just like my dad was, and I'm gonna end up like my dad's dad was. And I'm not, it, so school doesn't matter to me. So when we look at, we have to look at the larger historical context of a greater system within the United States of America, which is a country built on people of color's backs, and that, that people have been getting marginalized and screwed over for 250 years. And to say that we have a system in schooling right now that hasn't changed much in 250 years, and we're gonna expect different results, that's where I think in the early part of the conversation we we're talking about need to turn it up on its head. At the same time, I've got 322 beautiful little people in our room, in our school, that it's my responsibility to help provide them, help instill a, a mindset of, I am somebody, I'm not gonna let anybody else define my path in my life, and I'm gonna take advantage of what we've got in school, and I'm gonna work on breaking down barriers with, with families who they may have had miserable schooling experiences, and all that compounds itself generation after generation. A and we need to do some really, just I feel, a radically different approach to how we do school if we're gonna uh, change the, that predictability I spoke about earlier. Brian, that it, gives me yeah. hope. And yeah. so yeah. part of it is not even calling this the achievement gap, but looking at l research by people like Gloria Ladson Billings um, from the University of Madison, who talks about pay repaying an education debt that, you know, it's not about a gap, but it's about some of us who have had privilege repaying that debt to those on whose back this society was built. We are so out of time. Oh, this is such a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, did, 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 I know Dr. Dr. Brookins was like, I, I, so, so why don't you take us out? Take us out with, with, with your comment, and then... Uh, beyond the rhetoric. Yep. Yeah. And we've had a great discussion. And so the beyond the rhetoric looks different for each of us. When I listen to Ryan, it's that positive interaction from a white male to black families that's going to break down that lack of trust that they've had. Uh, the work that you're doing, you said you were a writer and then you became a parent uh, advocate, lifting the, amplifying the voices of students. Mm -hmm. Your experiences, you know, with, uh, with your community, that, to me, that captures the essence of beyond the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. When I think about myself, I left a, a job in St. Paul, made a lateral move, and people ask, Brookings, why did you, you know, go to the quote unquote suburbs? And I tell them this, because I wanted to have a positive impact on the lives of young white males. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, like, yes, think about that. When I, I think about every day. <laughs> every day. Because I'm trying to do that too. Every day. <laughs> because if you want to change a system, you're going to have to change the people within that mm -hmm. system. And the source of the pain oh, yeah. is often Correct. there. And it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's about, you know, uh, increasing that awareness, but also them seeing Dr. Brookings not only as their principal, but as a black man mm -hmm. that they can have a pa positive That's encounter true. with. And, so. and, and, and I think that this capsulates everything that we're talking about that will help us to get beyond the rhetoric. My name is Andre Cohen. I want to thank you so much for being with us. Um, again, uh, Beyond the Rhetoric is a series, an ongoing series sponsored here, partly by SPNN. My name is Andre Cohen, and we'll see you on our next show, Beyond the Rhetoric. Have a great day. <laughs>